Um, but yes, he uh, he spoke about it in detail. Um, but particularly the worst part, which was the um, the march out of the camp towards the end of the war. They thought they they were they might. Uh, be gassed because they'd heard about what was going on in other parts of uh, Germany and Poland and Russia. Um, they thought they might have been shot uh, or used as some sort of bargaining tool for the division of Germany. They, they weren't sure of their, their future. A lot perished on the, on the war. Uh, quite a few were accidentally shot by our unknown aircraft thinking they were German columns. Um, a lot died of exposure and hunger, uh, and some were shot and boneted by the, the guards. Not too many, uh, but it was uh, the weather was the was the killer. Um, a black and white still from the movie uh, The Wooden Horse. Very clever fellows. Um, uh, my father's pictured in this one here. Again, it's, it's very, very blurry, blurry. I think he's in the back row. Um, he's, he's often standing next to Paul Rickhill, who was his good mate. Um, a scene from the, the theatres that they put on, and of course, uh, doing makeup and uh, false moustaches and beards and what have you were also a, a, a skill learned for the escape committee as well. Um, the camp commandant, uh, von Lindy, not a bad sort of a fellow. Not, they're all Luftwaffe looking after Air Force and looking after the, the British. Um, wasn't a bad sort of a fellow, except he knew he, he was in deep trouble for allowing uh, an escape on his watch. And uh, he actually survived till uh, 1965, I think he died. Um, so he, he wasn't shot by the Gestapo for allowing an escape. But he was most annoyed at uh, at the escape on on the on the morning of Harry, and uh, demanded an, an immediate count or appeal of uh, of the prisoners. And my father was um, one of the ones that irritated von Lindeen by instead of standing in line, there were a bunch of them walking around, and making it difficult for them to count. And he uh, lost he, uh, the grip and demanded that uh, my father and others uh, go to the cooler. And that, that's mentioned on page 220 in Paul Wickhill's book, where in the movie, The Great Escape, Steve McQueen was endlessly chucking that baseball. So my father had two, two weeks of solitary confinement uh, in the underground uh, 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 jail cage. Uh, and another picture of the, uh, the photograph of the uh, list of uh, people who were killed. A uh, picture of Roger Wishell, who masterminded it. I can't remember the name of the British actor that played uh, Roger Wishell. Uh, these were actually Stalag Luft three people, although there were, as I said, 80,000 uh, marching. Uh, but this happened to be a group of Stalag Luft three people uh, towing their sleds. Um, uh, up towards uh, uh, northern Germany, and the um, the column was uh, up to ten kilometres long. It's a it's a fantastic book if you ever uh, would like to know more about that part of the uh, the prisoner's life. Um, Modern day style of Gloucester. My nephew went to uh, uh, Zagon in recent years and took some really, really good photographs that I'm going to put on the uh, on the presentation. Um, a lot of the original uh, tunnels and were discovered, uh, were reopened, and uh, lots of artifacts found. Not so good if you're claustrophobic. The, um, I read a couple of recent facts. The uh, British airmen invented a, a so-called um, 
applause machine um, that sounded from the outside to the Germans like the, the, there was a show going on in the uh, in the theatre, but it was actually devious work making uniforms and doing other things. They also uh, sent uh, Monopoly games um, produced by um, a subcontractor, a Boddington's Proprietor Limited in London, and the um, Monopoly games were uh, tainted, uh, uh, as it were, with um, two-piece files, compasses, silk maps, uh, and other bits and pieces, including the Monopoly money, was mainly Monopoly money, but there were a large denomination um, of German and, um, and French money mixed in with it as well. And the boxes that the, that the um, uh, tainted ones were in had a little red mark which looked, looked like a printing error on, on, the, on the box themselves, so they knew uh, which were the good Monopoly games and which were the normal ones. Okay, so anyone have any questions for Richard at all? Um, yeah. I, can I make, Leslie, make a yep. comment? Where are we? Can you hear me, Anne? Yeah, yes, yes. Leslie, I, um, thank you, Richard, for that. I've done a, um, a lot of work on the POW camps and Starlight uh, 3. I'd just like to share with everyone a really happy story from there. The last Christmas before they went on the long march, um, it was a very, very cold at that particular time. They put on, they made um, decorations out of old tins and strung them across the rooms. And they put on um, the whole Messiah, Messiah, Handel's Messiah. They did that. They did it in the church or the theatre, whatever that I could call it. And they had a full choir, a uh, full, um, sorry, orchestra and choir. And they did put that on, which was an absolutely brilliant thing to do right on Christmas. And Santa Claus came that Christmas uh, and dressed him up and they had um, Red Cross parcels and they'd been saving them and been saving the mail that had been coming in and they saved it all up and on Christmas they handed, Santa Claus came and handed everything out to them. And that was very sad because I think it was the 19th of January they left Starlog um, looked three to head off on the long march. I think they started on the 19th. Different camps started at different times from about the 19th through to the 25th. So, um, and what he was, which is right, talking about being shot up by the RAF uh, planes, that was devastating. That They buried the people in a village just near where it happened. They, or what was left of them after being shot up. Um, 15 died in one attack and countless number were injured. And they stopped the third wave by a fellow called Dean. I don't know whether he's mentioned in your father's book. He got through, he took a German guard and an army chap with him. And they went through the enemy lines, through no man's land. And they got to the next AIF posting and told them, you know, you've got to tell them to stop this. And they stopped the third wave coming through. Then they went back to their column because they promised the German guard or the commandant in charge that they wouldn't escape. They could have just walked away. They went all the way back. That was a sort of loyalty that they had developed amongst themselves. But I do like the Christmas story from Starlark 3, the last one they had in the camp. And that's a big undertaking from a group of men to put on the Messiah. It would have been lovely. They packed into the church uh, theatre, which was in the centre of the compound. Boys from Lambstorf, where well, they were on the road too, they had one of the worst camps because they were shackled. Their commandant shackled them, which was very, very, not when they were marching, they were in the camp, they were shackled. So that was very sad. Okay, thank you, Richard. Yes, some of the guards were of, of very, very um, equally poor condition. And um, uh, on some occasions, uh, our fellows were actually carrying the weapons of the guards and they were sharing food. And uh, even when they pulled into, I think it was a, a town called Springburg where the um, Panzer Division were, and, and they, the Panzer Division helped with accommodation or finding accommodation and finding food. It was, a, it was quite, uh, quite bizarre. A lot of the villagers helped them too. 
yes. as a came from villages, it was yes. uh, it, it was it was a wonderful sort of a thing to help them. Not that a lot of them survived really. Oh, another thing about um, that's written down somewhere, which I can't remember where. Starlog three, uh, Starlog looked three. Uh, in twenty two months, the Germans recorded the number of attempted escapes from that particular camp. And there were 262 attempted escapes. Yes. Whereas most of the other camps were not dead serious about escaping, but they were, the group that were there were very keen. Uh, and the Germans were logging it, <laughs> logging yes. down all the attempted escapes. 262 is not bad, is it? That, that does not include my Dave Allen skit. That was a different one again. Mm. Uh, if you can look that up, it's quite a funny little ending for the, for the, uh, for the talk about uh, Star of Glory 3. Mm. Richard, what did your father think of the film? He saw it was filmed in, in Canada. He said it was very, very good. I was with him when he saw it for the first time many, many years ago. He said the sand colour was very, very good, the pine tree. Um, uh, pine trees were very, very good. There were lots of trees within the compound, but uh, that was just a means of attempting to escape, so the Germans cut them all down. But uh, he said it, was, it looked very, very real, and he was quite pleased with the way they'd uh, depicted the camp. Uh, Richard, if I could just put a couple of little bits in. Having watched the movie a few times, the um, the, the the real life character, Squadron Leader Bushel, uh, in the movie they changed the name to Squadron Leader Bartlett, and he was played by Richard Attenborough. Um, and again, in the movie, there was one Australian character in it by the name, uh, his name in the movie was Sedgwick, played by James Coburn. Yes. Um, the aspect of the movie that really disturbed me was the amount that was shot from escaping. Um, in the movie, they mentioned 80, is, is that correct? Uh, no, it was, it was 50, 55 odd that was shot. Uh, Hitler wanted them all shot. And uh, Goering said, oh, how about we just shoot half of them? And then Hitler came back and said, no, let's, hit, let's kill more than half of them. Let's shoot more than half of them. So they ended up with that particular number. And I, they, they were actually selected according to the internet, uh, uh, whether they were married, whether they had children, there were... There were some reasons why some were shot and some weren't. At, at what stage did your father hear about that incident? Uh, two days later, the guards were horrified. Von Lindeen was shattered it, because they sort of developed a little bit of a bond, Air Force to Air Force. And as I said before, not many of them were members of the party. And um, uh, they were just as shocked uh, um, and Bushels, uh, it was depicted in the film, said uh, how many were wounded while escaping, and they said none. Yeah. And uh, yeah. then the truth got out in the, in the next few days. It was only a few days after the shooting that they found out. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for your talk. I, I really appreciated everything you put out there today. Thank you. Any other questions for Richard or comments? Just shout out because I can't always tell with the Zoom screens. There's about 40 of us online at the moment. So if I miss sure. anyone, I'm sorry. Uh, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, the other thing, Richard, that that, uh, that um, shocked me was the whole nature of keeping a diary within a, a camp like that. I mean, they'd have to be careful about giving away clues about what they were doing. Um, it, it, yeah, it was a bit interesting to sort of just get your head around the fact that you were keeping a diary while trying to keep an escape secret. Um, and uh, the rarity of these diaries is another thing. I mean, I noticed online there's, um, there aren't any freely available online. Some are up for auction and Dr. Kristen Alexander, who was going to be the other, um, yes. your companion speaker today, um, just mentioned about the rarity rarity of them, but gave the background to the humanitarian work that was going on to make these prisoners' lives better. Um, so the, the cultural aspect is always also shocking to me, the, the fact that they were allowed to um, get education, um, they were allowed music and all these other sort of things. That... Do you have any comments on that in terms of well, how he... Actually, 
enjoyed the entertainment as well. They enjoyed it as much as uh, our, our fellows. And if if they were all happy and occupied, they might not have been wanting to escape. But, uh, anyway. So it was kind of encouraged by the guards and, yes. and prison authorities to keep them. <laughs> there were some uh, unusual, shall we say, relationships developed between the Germans and the uh, and the Allies, uh, and, and that was used as a lever to get cameras, photographic paper, photographic fluids, and mm. all sorts of other bits and pieces they required, radio parts, and they, they used to uh, bribe the guards, and um, um, there were a couple of unusual relationships developed between for the purely for the purposes of bribery okay. all right um if there aren't any any further questions yes. for richard i'd uh, point you to the hunter living history site if you want to see all the materials that richard has provided for us um and dr Kristen alexander has also provided some material as well um just basically putting the diary in a, in a wider context um, there's the whole diary is completely scanned and thanks to the family we've been able to put it up there um, and there's a whole lot of um, accompanying material from Richard and his sister as well um, so yes the links in the in the chat so make a copy of it before you you jump out of the meeting um, and thank you very much Richard for making the time to come and present to us today and thank you people thank you